Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming along tonight uh, to listen to me speak about the critical metal tellurium. I'm going to be talking to you about the minerals that it forms and the microbes that it interacts with and why this is important, not just for me, but for our society as a whole. So firstly, what are critical metals? Critical metals are the commodities that may save us from climate disaster into the 21st century and hopefully beyond. Uh, these are the metals that we're going to be using for things like cleaner energy generation, electric cars, these sort of things. Many of you will have seen the IPCC climate change report come out last week. And this is one that's you know, really in getting us to act very quickly and find uh, better ways to look after the environment. And critical metals are one of the ways we're going to be um, moving forward into the future. They'll give us better ways of cleaner energy generation and give us a better option for the future rather than burning fossil fuels. But first, uh, for my element, I want to clear up a quick misconception. It is tellurium, not delirium. Delirium is a state of mind you might get into after studying too much. Tellurium is the chemical element. So it's not the same thing. I'm working on the, the element one, not the, the mental state. So tellurium is very rare. It's found at about one part per billion in the Earth's crust. It's about as rare as gold. Gold obviously being a very famous element, and many of us will have or know someone that's got a ring, so it's like a gold ring or a piece of jewellery, which you know, gold's been long prized for its beauty and for its sort of everlasting nature because it doesn't tarnish. Tellurium is often found with both gold and with silver because it can help transport these elements from deep in the mantle up towards the Earth's crust and into deposits. Let's get you to close your eyes for a second and think about some chemical elements that perhaps you can name. So perhaps you came up with things like gold or maybe carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. This is basically the toolkit that humanity has to work with to solve all our um, chemical, physical problems. We've got 118 elements we've discovered, about 90 occur naturally, and any solution for future planning must come out of these 90 elements. And tellurium is one of the ones we're going to be seeing more of into the future. One way that we can think about this is that tellurium is essentially a form of smelly solid oxygen. You can breathe in oxygen. Obviously, it's a very important element and forms a large proportion of the atmosphere, about 20%. Tellurium, you can't, and obviously you can't breathe it in, but it will be important for humans going forward. It was first found in the region of Transylvania in Romania about two centuries ago. This region is probably most famous for a mythical vampire but it's also where tellurium was first found. Traditional industrial uses of tellurium include alloying, rubber manufacture, and some electronics. But the new uses we're going to be seeing a lot more of are in solar panels in the form of cadmium telluride, also in some batteries. And together this leads to tellurium being classed as a critical metal. But what metals are critical? Different countries have different lists. Some of the ones that you might have heard of include things like lithium, cobalt, the rare earth elements, and as you may have guessed, tellurium as well for its use, particularly in solar panels, but also possible supply issues make it a critical metal we have to be looking out for. But what are the effects of critical metals on the environment? This isn't a perfect solution. If we just mine them willy nilly, if we dispose of them poorly, we might be creating new problems. This is where my research comes in. Tellurium as a contaminant, um, we're going to be using more of it, so there's greater risk of release of tellurium to the environment, such as if solar panels get damaged or disposed of incorrectly. Tellurium can also be released by nuclear disasters, or else we don't want these to happen, but the Fukushima disaster 10 years ago um, did prompt an increase in the study of tellurium by geochemistry. Tellurium also is released by coal burning, we'll see less of that hopefully, and by copper smelting. And mining sites generally release tellurium. This is a possible source of tellurium into the future. So tellurium cycling, it's for most elements, cycling is fairly complicated and there's still plenty of gaps to tellurium that I'm hoping to fill. The areas I'm particularly looking at are the weathering of tellurium away from ore deposits into the tailings. And then also using that as an analog for um, the breakdown of human produced compounds when they get put into landfills like solar panels. And tellurium isn't an essential element for living organisms. It's not essential trace, but what do microorganisms do to tellurium and can this help us understand the cycling of tellurium? As it turns out, yes, it can. So tellurium is known to be bioprecipitated by some microbes. They produce nanoparticles of tellurium. This has been shown in the lab quite a lot. 
hasn't been shown in nature before. And we were, one of the things I was doing was looking for nanoparticles in nature. Now, the other thing that tellurium can do uh, is be produced as a volatile compound for microbes to get rid of it because it is a fairly toxic element for microbes and we need to humans in soluble forms. We don't want too much of it in groundwater, for instance. So microbes can produce this compound. It looks a bit like this as a stylized diagram and it smells rather like garlic which means that tellurium, the element found in Transylvania, is also the perfect antidote to this guy, as a little aside. So garlic smelling compounds might give us a, um, an idea of where we've got tellurium to be found. So for my field work for my PhD, we went to nature's richest tellurium site, which is a place called Moctezuma in Mexico. It was once known as a gold mine, but now it really is. It's tellurium mine hosting gold. To get there required plenty of hard work walking through the desert early in the very early in the morning to reach there before it got too hot in the day. The road was completely impassable. Uh, the good thing about tellurium, as I mentioned, smells like garlic, so we could find it by digging for it and smelling for it and finding mineral deposits this way. So collected minerals and soil samples from this mine. So primary minerals that you might see of tellurium are things like gold tellurides. As an aside, this mineral was once used to pave the roads in Kalgoorlie before they realised there was gold in it and dug them back up. And there's also silver gold tellurides, such as sylvanite, named after Transylvania. Secondary tellurium minerals are ones which contain oxidized tellurium. And this is the, the stuff that microbes will get rid of if it's soluble, but it can also be locked up in pretty minerals with nice colors, such as this one, or estolite, lots of interesting Mexican names, sesbronite or wildcatite. And these are examples of tellurium minerals that can form in the oxidation zone where we've got breakdown of tellurium products occurring. Now, one thing we found is that tellurium is sucked up by iron oxides and they can actually lock up quite a lot of tellurium. So for one kilo of iron oxide, you can lock away 150 to 250 grams of tellurium per kilo of iron oxide. This was found in sort of the natural site and this might be a way to immobilize tellurium leaking from something like a landfill into the future. Now, I mentioned microbes a bit earlier on and it can be quite hard to tell which bacteria are putting in the hard yards to actually do the work in an environmental microbiology setting. You need to prove this with sort of things like gene studies. And what I did was to work out what microbes are living there. And we have the first evidence for natural tellurium nanoparticles. Um, so I found evidence of um, former bacterial cells um, right next to tellurium nanoparticles shown in bright on the left-hand panel here. And there's definitely some very strong evidence for bacterial mediation, you might call it a, a smoking gun for bacterial mediation of tellurium cycles in the environment. It's the first time we've really got evidence of this that's more concrete than just saying it happens in the lab, therefore it might happen in the environment. In particular, uh, proximal sites appear to have greater microbial diversity. So working together, they can um, combat high concentrations of a toxic critical metal such as tellurium. And in particular here, uh, the phylum in yellow in these two proximal samples has known uh, members that can reduce tellurium away from being toxic into less toxic forms, including nanoparticles. So critical metals will hopefully help us solve the problems of the future. It's our responsibility to ensure they don't create more problems than they solve. And that's what I'm hoping to keep doing with my work to really ensure that for metals such as tellurium, uh, they are, we understand what they're doing in the environment and they're not going to cause more issues. Humans are good, perhaps at creating imaginary monsters, but really what we have to think about now going forward into the 21st century is the very real issues that we have to face, such as climate change and critical metals is one key way in which we should certainly look to uh, improve humanity's prospects into the future. And we have to also understand that they don't create more problems than they solve. And that's really, I think, one of the key things is to ensure that environmental geochemistry of metals like tellurium and also cobalt and lithium is very, very thoroughly understood. So I'd like to thank you all for coming along and yeah, happy to engage any questions and whether today or, or afterwards. Thank you very much.